We gotta make a new snake. Mm, well, looks like I'll just have to uh, finish the snake off. <laughs> Three points to me. Good move. I'm devastated by it. Alright, oh, we got this done. French Swedish. Fire enough pain, top dollar for a small red fake fish. Want something more savory? And you've been waiting for a French Swedish fishery, where all varieties of fish can be found, all the color red. Enjoy the taste of real fish with the color of the candy you love. All fish contain massive amounts of red dye, please eat responsibly. French Swedish fishery. Seems fishy to me. Wow. Where does he find these people? No idea. I wish I could find the rainbow tail. Ow! <laughs> Damn! There you is! I've been looking all over for you! Calvin! It's been a dog's age. How have you been? Not now, Satan. Look, DM, what's going on, alright? The intro suddenly turned into a pod show host. I can't find a social anywhere, and uh, somebody seems to have, uh, I dare not say it, undeep seen all the fangly fishes, yo! It's madness! Look, not important. You need to get us out of here, right now! Before he comes back. Who? Oh. He who shall not be named, and I ain't talking about Voldemort. Oh, you mean T.M. Bacchus. No! <laughs> Funny, I thought you had to say his name three times. Kelvin, my best nemesis, how is you? Oh, you know, been better. Uh, forced to sleep, but uh, you know, that's not nothing, nothing to worry about. Anyway, uh, I forgot to scarecrow, so I'm gonna I'm 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 pop back and go get him, and, 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 and then I'm gonna chase you out of here with that, you know. Oh, yes, yes. Go ahead, say hi to Mr. Scarecrow for me. Ooh, what? Go on, do your anchor thing. I'll wait. Okay then, uh... I'll be waiting a long time. Oh no. Wait, I'm still here. Speed dial, speed dial, speed dial. Bacchus, let me alone, Bacchus. The speed dial's all been reprogrammed. Who could have done that? What are you doing with my Bacchus? Oh. Did someone do something with your Bacchus? <laughs> you monster! So honestly, your escape plan was Kelvin. Like any of yours have worked. You rude it, eh? You took my Bacchus! I'll get you! Kelvin, you want in next game? Really? Oh, well, we have three. Let's roll our rumble. Well, I guess in that case, in the words of Percy Pringle the Turd, Oh, yes! Thank you, the shadows. Make you start trying again. And maybe, if you start talking, you'll like the sounds that come out of your own mouth. Thanks. Anytime. So many choices. Let's see what we have. All the potential in the world. And what will I end up choosing? What's this? What is this? What an odd specimen. I mean, it's Rankin Bass, the same guys who made the Christmas specials, but this one just looks strange. Still, might be fun to take a look at. So, see y'all! What? What happened to my room? Oh, I unpacked it for you! Bacchus? Not the one you were thinking of. Ooh, and what is this? It's just a weird old film from what I can tell. Weird is all in perspective. Speaking of, you got something right there. Oh my 
doing in a drag garbage bag? <laughs> You got a letter. Did you open it this time? I just got home. Didn't really have time to snoop. <laughs> oh, goodness. Listen, you know I'd jump on a grenade for you. Might make Mom mad, but that, you're on your own. If uh, you need anything else, I'll be in my study. Oh, is Mom coming over? No, why? Well, you mentioned her, so I was just checking. Just call me, so I get on with it. Okay. <sighs> Dear Silo, you know the best kind of Christmas party? Besides a dance party, of course. Everyone knows it's a dance party, unless you're having a mad monster party. P.S. If you don't watch it, I'll grind your bones to mix my bread. Been in forever since I had a good loaf of bone bread. Now there's no going back and there's something undead in your mind and your eyes and your heart and your head. Now there's no going back and there's something undead in your mind and your eyes and your heart and your head. Now there's no going back and there's something undead in your mind and your eyes and your heart and your head. Now there's no going back and there's something undead in your mind and your eyes and your heart and your head. Now there's no going back and there's something undead in your mind and your eyes and your heart and your head. The holidays bring out the best in everyone as well as the worst. You have altruism, family, scams greed, love, and fraud in bountiful supply. It's in the spirit of that strange dichotomy that most holiday specials are created. A unique breed of entertainment, these stories have popped up since the unusual success of one Charles Dickens and his Carol released in 1843. This short story proved not only popular, but marketable. From this first holiday cash-in, the rest of the genre took its cues. These tales usually take place at the end of the calendar year, where many major holidays fall. We have some curmudgeonly characters berating the season, the rest of the cast trying to remind those Scrooges of the joy it brings. It's the template for every Hallmark movie shown in December. The winter solstice has been a major celebration for people all over the world for millennia, but no one quite captured the spirit of that time of year like Rankin and Bass. How do I describe their work? I'd like to be a, a dentist. A dentist? <laughs> Well, we need one up here. I've been studying its fascinating. You've no idea. Molars and bicuspids. Unforgettable. A duo who specialized in animagic, a term they coined for their particular take on stop-motion animation, Rankin and Bass began their career in traditional animation, including a TV movie version of Return to Oz. My guess is it had less nightmare fuel than the 1980s rendition, though I wouldn't count out the man who gave the world this. I still lose sleep at night. Their first big break came in 1964 when they released a television short called Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's utterly ridiculous and fantastic. The charming tone of these bizarre characters endeared them to a mainstream audience and also caught the eye of producer Joseph E. Levine, famous for producing Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, who greenlit a three-picture deal for this fledgling animation company. It's so weird to think that Rank and Bass were an overnight success when their work is so ubiquitous in popular culture. So before the studio made any more holiday specials, they first produced the film Willie McBean and His Magic Machine, which I've never heard of, and a well-received special on Smokey the Bear. These both used their now-trademark Animagic style, but Willie McBean did not fare well at the box office. 
Scrambling to fulfill their contract with Levine, Rankin and Bass dove into two projects simultaneously, a traditional animated feature called The Wacky World of Mother Goose, which I've also never heard of, and another animagic vehicle known today as Mad Monster Party. This seems like a weird choice today, since Rankin and Bass are known for their Christmas specials, but given when they made it, it actually makes sense. This is the same company that had success with one major holiday, why not tackle another? It's not like these two times a year have radically different tones, just make it about monsters instead of Santa. They released it in 1967, a blistering pace for stop motion animation. Each take had to be done in a single day so that the animators wouldn't forget the character's direction, and long scenes could take weeks to shoot. This feature was truly a mammoth undertaking, second only in runtime to The Daydreamer, another animagic film by Rankin Bass, which I've never heard of. With so much of their non-television work relegated to a forgotten past, why does Mad Monster Party stay in the conversation? Is it that good compared to the other feature-length attempts? Is it because Halloween-obsessed people glommed onto it? Are they the reason this 55-year-old film has a Blu-ray release? Only one way to find out, by watching it. Oh, my old friend. How are you? I have something for you. <sighs> wow. Um... Okay, I guess I just start at the beginning. Yeah. We start with Boris Karloff on the Isle of Evil, who develops a weapon of mass destruction that he blows up a raven with so that he can retire. That's not gonna work. Hey, Ant. What? C could you come down here? What? Could you come down here? Hold on, I can't hear you. Let me come down. <sighs> What's up, Psy Guy? You know Mad Monster Party? <laughs> I mean, who doesn't? Why is this a classic again? You know, it's just something we watch since childhood around this time of year. Regardless how weird it is and how little it actually has to do with the holiday, not everything can be peanuts. Hail Snoopy. I know, it's just... something doesn't feel right. Look, do you want me to review this before you submit it to the publisher? Maybe in a bit. I, I still need to finish. Thank you. Anytime, Psy Guy. I've just about finished my Man of Spooing Party costume. We'll trade it begins once I clean up the hem. Snoopy? Manos. Ooh. I guess it could be worse. I've seen things that I cannot unsee. I know things that can only be shared through communal experience. This is why I'm sharing with you that Mad Monster Party, no matter what it is to the masses, is one weird film. Let's take it from the top. We start with a series of closed caption frights. It was a common convention of the era, now only known to those who love Willy Wonka and his psychedelic word sequences. We see more than jump scares as we travel over a bone-filled graveyard. And make no mistake, this film is a beautiful showcase of what their animagic could do when they were at their best. We're introduced to the Isle of Evil, where Baron Von Frankenstein is hard at work creating... Mad Science? One of two big-name celebrities in the cast, Boris Karloff voices Baron Von Frankenstein. He was of alien health at this time, but the production made a trip to England specifically to record his part at his home. Hearing that classic voice of horror coming through this visage really adds legitimacy to the whole production. This opening sequence also shows off why Rankin Bass called their process animagic. Seriously, how did they pull off those sparks in stop motion? It was the 60s! 
Baron von Frankenstein has completed his last experiment, which he tests on his pet raven. You'd think that it turns monstrous or begins speaking, you know, the usual horror movie cliche, but instead... I wish I could tell you that this act of destruction serves some greater purpose in the movie beyond this pun. Ha ha ha, quoth the raven, nevermore. First three minutes and I'm already groaning from the jokes. This is going to be a long ride. Frankenstein immediately sends invitations to all the monsters to come to the island. I'd argue with this plot point, but since the movie's title has party in it, I'll let it slide. We take a trip across many different lands as a memorable original song belts over images of Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy, Jekyll and Hyde, all the classic horror movie monsters. Oh, and the Hunchback of Notre Dame. From his film appearances, Quasimodo seems more like a victim than a monster. I wonder if they originally made him as Igor but then relabeled him to pare down on the Frankenstein ensemble that overwhelms this cast. From there, we meet Felix Flanken, a bubbling Jimmy Stewart impression who's so bad at his job at the drugstore that he's two months' salary in debt to it. Well, he also gets his mail there, so maybe he's just working for his rent? It's hard to tell, we won't be here long. He receives an invite to the island in the Caribbean where his uncle Boris resides. Felix is falling over himself at the prospect and destroys many displays trying to leave for the island. So now all the players are in motion, making haste to get to that island. Back at the castle, we spy the monsters spying on... Who is that? Well, before we get an answer, the monster's mate grabs him and Phyllis Diller's all over the place. Makes sense since she voices the woman. You, you oh, monster. and she's saying... Oh, you're different. Two show-stealing songs in the first 12 minutes. Is this my first musical? We finally discover the name of that woman from the hallway, Francesca. She aids Baron von Frankenstein while he wanders around a lad that the Adams family would be proud of. I wonder if they took inspiration from the original show. Both were quirky cult phenomenons that came out in the 1960s. Well, they don't share any cast, so it's probably a coincidence. Unless... Who are you talking to? <laughs> did... did Hent let you in? I didn't see it. No, not it. Who were you talking to? Well, I was... I guess I was talking to myself. Careful with that. It can be habit forming. Where did you come from? You look like you needed help, and that's what I was made for. Oh, well thanks, but uh, I think I can handle this one by myself. If you say so. Should probably offer you some water since you are a... Yeah. What? Nothing! Frankenstein tells his red-haired companion that he's retiring, and his nephew, Felix Flanken, is a sole heir to his discoveries. She is quite upset by this, and I would be too. You have a very short resume when you work in isolation on mad science. Just ask President Insano. We're 15 minutes in, and it seems like we've laid good groundwork to get to the party, yes? We know who's invited, we're aware of the impending conflict, and it's just going to be excitement from here on, as soon as everyone gets to the island. Well, folks, I hope patience is one of your virtues. We get to spend plenty of time with the monsters, each one boarding the ship in their own unique way. I think I have better fly. Felix steals Velma's bet by losing his glasses before interacting with said monsters. Oh, oh wait, this came out two years before Scooby-Doo launched. So technically, Velma stole Felix's bit. I don't like that. Here's where the plot starts to feel a little overstuffed. After the quick boarding sequence, the film decides to make the captain invite all of his guests to dinner on the ship. Spoilers, this dinner never happens. The first mate suffers through three frightful formal extensions, each ending in a cowardly escape, before we cut to Felix playing hide-and-seek with Mr. Hyde. See, because Mr. Hyde just repeats the word hide over and over, so Felix hides. Once these fillers are finished, we see each monster abandoning ship, including a snarky Dracula. Now, friends, 
you'll discover who was the original Batman. Shots fired, Adam West. That was just to myself, not anyone else! Here we find Yetch the Wretch, the manservant of the manor, getting instructions on what to do for his soon arriving guest. He then hits on Francesca so hard that she flips him over and sends him crawling. You... creep! She noticed me! For the first time, she noticed me! Honestly, Yetch is kind of upsetting. And he's kind of real. You know, you can have a seat, you don't have to loom. You're not going to make me regret this, are you? Are you real? As real as the problem Yetch represents. He's not just a creep, but one who takes any bit of attention as positive in his mind, even when I'm throwing him across the room. Later on, he lashes out when I dare not meet the expectations that he's construed in his head. He's an incel. And as silly as he seems, anyone who can identify with him should take a look in a mirror. You know, you were quite the progressive character for the era in which you were made. Not really. Wait till you see who I fall in love with. Then why are you saying what needs to be said? Just doing as I was made to do. <laughs> who made you- Damn, she's fast. There's actually some killer punchlines in here across a few different setups that are visually fun, but I can say that these airplanes won't come into play until the final minutes of the film, so I'm not sure why they're launching now. Keep in mind, we're half an hour into this 90 minute movie and the monsters are still not on the island. When they do arrive, each monster descends the staircase to all the obvious jokes about their character. Phyllis Diller gets some classic zingers in among them, followed by her trademark laugh. One downside, we see Dr. Jekyll transform back into Mr. Hyde for the third time in three appearances. He's starting to feel like a one-trick pony. For the next 4 minutes and 44 seconds, we are subjected to Yetch in the kitchen, and this is where the pacing really starts to stall. I know this movie's a classic, but even the creators admit that, in order to help pad the script to feature length, this scene was an unnecessary add-in. Also, there's a couple of things that rub people the wrong way nowadays. It features, um, a really Italian stereotype named Mafia Machiavelli. Oh, and Mafia gooses Yetch at one point while he's trying the appetizers. Just a pinch of this, a pinch of that, uh, a pinch of this, <laughs> a pinch of that. Ouch! Stop already with the pinching. I feel like this low-hanging fruit was touching the ground. After that detour, we finally begin the party, where conspiracies are already beginning to hatch. I can make the doctor's secrets mine before he bestows them on that Felix Flanken. And I can use Dracula to help me. Francesca is up to something with that Dracula. They both bear watching. Besides, it's her own fault for thinking so loud. Hold on, does, does that count as a fourth wall break? I mean, that wasn't really a thing at this point, and they just kind of had a nice, easy going back and forth with the- Maybe, maybe this is Francesca's monster power! I should ask her! Francesca! What? Uh, sorry, just talking to myself. Where is she when you need her? After just two minutes of plot, Mad Monster Party finally breaks out and dance. Forget the commuting, I want more of these sequences. They're ridiculous fun. When Rankin Bass is firing on all cylinders, it does things no other animation company can do. I could watch this scene forever. Come. Psst. I must talk to you. Alone. Out on the balcony. Oh, why did that end so soon? Although, really, it was just a hair over two minutes, comparable to the previous scene, but this one just flew by. A first for this film. One of the goals of good filmmaking is to compress time. A fantastic film acts like time travel, making two hours disappear in what feels like half that time. On the opposite side of that, I once listened to the Manos The Hands of Fate soundtrack on a 15 minute break to make it feel like an hour lunch. It worked, too. I've got to stop bringing Manos up, it gives me the willies every time. So. What's Francesca plotting? It's our time to shine, yeah. Our turn in line. 
we're four songs in now, and I guess my first musical's going pretty well. Every song is catchy and memorable, if slightly drawn out. After some eavesdropping and consequent violence, the party becomes a food fight. This does feature all the monster's powers, but its execution feels like half-speed blocking in a play. Perhaps that was to slow things down intentionally, because next we get to watch everyone sleeping off the party. There's a whole sequence that's just watching how the sleep went for the monsters. And there's five fades to black during this. You fade down, you fade up. It felt like a commercial break in the middle of a film. Did I mention we haven't seen Felix since the monsters got off the ship a half hour ago? What are they doing? Finally, Felix arrives back in the film, where Francesca and von Frankenstein meet him at the shore. Francesca waves to Felix, who ignores her. She also gets blanked by Boris before Yetch offers her a sleazy hand. She promptly slaps the wretch. Do you blame me? Well, no. We've established that he's a creep. I mean about being in a bad mood around Felix. Yeah, why do you hate him so much? He symbolizes everything that I hate about the world that I live in. While Francesca is a smart, fierce woman who takes no guff from anyone, she's only acknowledged as a secretary by Von Frankenstein, who makes it publicly known that she will not be the one to carry out his work, despite being his active assistant in early scenes. Every man in her life either hits on her or ignores her as a person, despite what she's capable of. She's nothing but an object to be won or sit on a shelf. In walks Felix. A total klutz, completely incompetent, and ignorant of everything he's inheriting. And I'm just supposed to smile and keep things running while the Baron hands the reins over to fumbling Felix? If you were me, you'd be pissed off too. I'm sorry that you fall in love with Felix. Yeah, me too. You know, I don't have to write this review in such a linear way. I could jump around, you know, hop back to this time, revisit you before- You haven't been writing this review for a while now. <laughs> of course I- Okay, where'd you hide it? Keep doing what you were doing. Pretend I'm not even here. I'm serious, I have to send in the magazine article tomorrow. For Drick and Dog Girl. Kind of a weird name for a- Let's start the third act. Francesca enacts a series of plans to make Felix have an unfortunate accident, each one meeting with less success than the last. I'll dub this sequence Felix the Unflappable, because he's completely oblivious to all the harm he narrowly dodges. Makes the man who knew too little look competent. After this slapstick fest, Uncle Boris finally brings Flanken up to speed on the premise of the movie, which makes the little guy uneasy. So how does Von Frankenstein help his nephew become comfortable becoming the new leader of the monsters? Through song. When they tell you, read page one, read three more and you'll find that the very next day when you are done, the group is way behind. You gotta stay one step ahead. Stay one step ahead. I never thought I'd hear Boris Karloff singing with a bunch of dancing monsters. Also, this marks the first on-screen appearance of Willem Dafoe. Pure genius. Francesca takes the opportunity to turn against everyone in the castle. Since she feels that she's been betrayed by not only her co-conspirators as well as her boss, she invites one last monster to the party, one simply known as It. It's mentioned once before, when Frankenstein is sending off invitations to initially to all the party members, and can, can we just stop for a moment and acknowledge how many crucial plot points and threads stem from invitations and invite acceptance? I mean, this is a monster movie! Am I asking you too much? I'm all for sticking with the premise, but my god! A vital scene over an hour in involves writing a formal invitation to some unintroduced final character. Considering how long it took the others to get there, it should arrive just in time for the last ten minutes. And after all this talk of it, it had better be Tim Curry. He's the life of the party. <laughs> When the monsters finally follow Francesca through the trap door, what feels like an eternity later, she escapes them by diving into the arms of Felix, who she then starts unloading all of her feelings on. Everything and I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! You're hysterical. Calm down. I, I hate to do this. Could we not? Ah, you've gotta stop doing that! 
even though this movie portrays this moment as comedic, the fact that Felix slaps a hysterical woman just to make her calm down, only to have her instantly fall in love with him, it's honestly more insulting than the edge. Well, the film does address this fact. Sorry about that. Oh, Felix. Oh, you're not mad? Oh, Felix. I think you're still hysterical. Stop. See, they're also admitting that turning hate into love with a slap is just ludicrous. They're taking a character with very real motivations and understandable frustrations and making her into a prize for the last minute hero. It honestly would have been better if the crocodiles had eaten me. You're probably right. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. Thanks for giving me this soapbox. I didn't give you anything. You just came in here. No, I didn't. I'm just what you think of Francesca. Wait, what? Don't let this power go to your head. Use it to give more voices to the voiceless. I still don't under... Why am I even surprised? After the obligatory coupling, there's another song. This one, a love ballad sung by Francesca. You know what? No. You can't ease the audience into true love that resulted from head trauma. I refuse. For those playing along at home, that's musical sequence number six in this non-musical feature. And if I'm being generous, only two of the songs are remotely monster related. When Felix and Francesca try to flee the island, the rest of the monsters form an angry mob to chase after them. Great irony there. When this chase scene comes to an end, the arrival of it kicks the ending into high gear. I have to say, I was really surprised by it. By that I mean I was surprised that it wasn't named King Kong. Kaijus aren't horror movie monsters, right? They're their own thing. The finale really shifts in tone, but I actually think the animation here is superb. You don't usually get this kind of expressive personality out of gargantuan monsters like it, but I can really see the distinct personality and drive, like his wanting to destroy castles and falling in love with red-headed women. He even gets to flick Yetch into the stratosphere when he's trying to kiss a tied-up Francesca. Oh. Oy vey! That Francesca is something! <sighs> Knew you'd like that. The old tech plane starts circling it, making this a complete ripoff of King Kong. Baron tricks it into capturing him so that Francesca and Felix can safely leave the island. Once they're clear, Frankenstein decides that enough's enough. You overgrown chimpanzee. Now you shall see the Baron von Frankenstein is not one to cross. True, you won't see it for too long a time, but for one second, oh boy. Boy, it's gonna be a sight when it blows. Well, that was just weird. That sentiment actually sums up the whole film quite well. Mad Monster Party came out at the time when Rankin Bass was a new face, and it easily could have been their last contribution. Its lovable, quirky characters just felt mean and soulless without a solid premise to anchor to. It wasn't Halloween, it wasn't horror. It was a mashup of corny comedy and spooky visuals with occasional allusions to pain and death mixed in. I mean, it's old, it's weird, it's oddly paced, it's got a terrible payoff at the end, and yet... You know, the end was just some work, clearly, but... I can see this being an unsung classic, even if it does feel like a three-hour trip. You could take its three-hour tour, because it feels like you're never getting off this island. Psycho! And I'll look at your dress later! Psycho, you should not deny the will of the master. Oh my god, what happened to you? He is a merciful master, if you do what he wills. If not... <laughs> oh, what the hell is going on here? What do you need to get through this? What? My sister's turned into a zombie, so that's not great! What can I do? Fly, you fool! <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Oh. Wow. This guy was a ton. 
Subs Hill? I'm glad no see. What are you doing here? Trying to save the future. How can I help? Well, I think I was cute. I know I was sexy. Hand me that Shawn Michaels. Well, don't you know what they say? The cream always rises to the top. Let's go. Well then, that sounds just perfectly acceptable to me. Hand me that Kurt Hannon. Kill me will play the real rumble with you. And it's true. It's damn true. Well, like that says, I is a jet flying, kiss stealing, wheeling dealing, woo! And I can't keep these gators down! I guess if that's the case. <laughs> well, I guess it's time for everybody to have a nice day! Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>